We now turn to the subject of drill shafts and auger cast piles. Uh, drill piles have become a very important part of, of deep foundations. At one time, uh, the rule in deep foundations was drive piles and lots of them. And to a large extent, that has been derailed by the advent of drill shafts and to a lesser extent, auger cast piles. And so we need to discuss these. These are, this is becoming a very important part of the, um, of the deep foundation scene, as I mentioned. So let's get to it. A good place to start is to review why we have deep foundations at all. Uh, we have deep foundations because they will withstand loads and that what well, shallow foundations are incapable of and that they transfer the loads we have, we put on them down to more competent strata. And that's just as true with deep foundations as I mean, with drill shafts as it is with driven piles. The loading of deep foundations, uh, again, we talked about lateral loading. I just the last lecture spoke of lateral loading, but we also have tension loading and compression loading. Uh, tension loading, uh, deep found, drill shafts have an have a, uh, additional advantage in that drill shafts tend to be very large and very heavy, and they can be used as large ballast. Such as, sometimes you see this with shallow foundations as well, but the drill shaft, the way the shaft is, is significant. That's one important difference between a drill shaft and a driven pile. There are and we'll talk about why that's so, and it's not just because they're heavy either. And we talk about types of deep foundations, and the drill shafts are um, located um, or in cast in place or cast in place piles. As is common. We like to, I'm going to, what I call drill shafts are called by all other kinds of terminology. We always like to confuse uh, newbies or other uninitiates into the, in this business with different terminologies for the same thing. And drill shaft people are just as good at this as driven pile people are. Um, basically, a drill shaft is fairly simple. You have a, it's a cylindrical column, and basically in it is, you basically, it, it is a, there's a rebar cage in it, uh, which reinforces it. And basically the, uh, you drill a hole in the ground, you put a cylindrical cage, you drop concrete into it, literally drop it, and then you have a foundation. It's a fairly simple process. And in some cases, you have bells at the bottom of it, which are primarily used to res help resist uplift loads. And we'll talk about those, particularly when we get to expansive foundations. Um, drill shafts or any kind of drilled or dug foundation or basically an extension of, of started as extension of shallow foundations. And in fact, until the 1920s, most of them were hand dug. Um, there were talk, we talked about the Chicago well method used the wooden barrel type of frame, which is shown here. Um, uh, if you are interested in this history, probably one of the great experts on it is J. David Rogers at the Missouri, um, science and technology. Um, and he can talk at length about just about anything he puts his mind to. Uh, including this, but he's very has a very interesting history of this, uh, as was the case in the, the driven, as was the case in a lot of the marine driven piles. It was developed in the Chicago area. Uh, from a uh, Ch Chicago was not the ideal place to put a city in an era when um, driven when. Um, deep foundations were only be starting to get be developed um, and actually went past um, 
driven it actually we actually, we actually went past uh, driven piles to start with and then we got more into the, the dug or board piles mostly dug in the beginning the Chicago well method and those things you ask well how did a Chicago based company like yours survive this well that's easy first of all ours was largely focused on marine work and marine anything and second of all the company uh, sent its equipment far and wide into places where uh, like South Louisiana coastal areas and whatnot where driven piles were were and still have an advantage over other types of foundations so um, just because you start out in one thing you need it's important to be versatile and adapt to the conditions that you uh, find yourself in and one way of doing that is to broaden your horizons in terms of your market or your expertise um, drilling technology however is something that the construction industry has to a large extent the big driver in the advances of drilling construction are not the construction industry it's the oil industry the oil industry had to drill to get to their to, to oil and they had to do so fairly or i mean you know you see this videos or pictures of spindle tops spewing oil they, they had to drill down a little bit for that but the longer they kept exploring for oil the deeper they had to go and so they developed some very sophisticated drilling technologies and they still have very sophisticated drilling technology and uh, these were adapted for much shallower but larger diameter work and hence we have drill shafts today they're used in a wide variety of geographical areas um, and um, they, uh, they, they they find themselves in all types of, of applications. There are some situations where drill shafts are definitely the way to go, and they have they they've done quite well. Uh, part of that is due to the fact that their trade association has done an excellent job in educating the uh, uh, their their consumers, primarily departments of transportation, and other and private companies in the benefits of drill shafts so one of the things that any new technology in this in this business requires is a large initial education effort without it usually technology usually new technologies just don't go anywhere so what kind of equipment do you need it's somewhat simple most drill shafts are about 5 to 1200 millimeter 18 to 48 that's on the low side in some cases sometimes they get much larger they're up to six foot and uh, six uh, to 24 meters 28 feet in length and sometimes go longer than that uh, most of the time they are drilled with a truck mounted rig uh, specialized you have specialized units for longer or larger shaft and uh, longer or larger shafts use use them much more specialized uh, the key dip the key about drill shafts is this you'll notice that they have a this flighting this flighting is common to and we actually saw some of this with driven piles when we talked about pre-drill piles the flighting is just a helical piece of plate which has been bent into a helix uh, and rolled into a helix to be a little more specific about it, and then welded to a to a drill string in the case of drill shafts that helix is very short the drill shafts only the, the helix um, only just a few feet in length and basic and all it does is as it drills in the ground the sole comes up now the only place you have to be very careful about that is disposing of the tailings and sometimes if you're dealing with brownfield sites that can be a major problem with drill shafts or any drill piles is once you get the tailings out of the ground if they're if they have, are contaminated they have to be disposed of properly for um, for rock hardened teeth uh, can be added to the end of the auger to enhance rock drilling capability one of the big pluses of drill shafts and this was not obviously appreciated in the beginning is the fact that they can rock socket now the 
rock socket basically means is that you can, as you're drilling, you can switch bits to rock, hardened rock bits. And by the way, hardened rock bits are another specialty of the oil field. And you can actually um, put a cylindrical indentation into the rock surface. And that helps you get past weathered rock and rock of iffy quality and gets you down to the firm to a, to a firmer, more solid rock. And once you get down there, then the drill shafts, when they you pour the put the rebar cage in, and you um, drop, you know, you put the concrete in, you're actually transferring your loads not just to soil, and not just to maybe weathered rock of dubious quality, but you're actually transferring it to a comp a very competent rock, and that's a big advantage with drill shafts because drill driven piles have um well in weathered rock it, they're okay but if you get into um if, if you need to get down to very solid rock uh impact particularly impact or even vibratory for that matter they just don't interact very well when they're act during installation and sometimes that can lead to the damage or destruction of the pile which you know kind of ruins the whole purpose Okay, advantages, they have uh, mobilization costs are fairly are lower. In some cases, they're lower. Um, they generate less noise and vibration. Uh, the diameter length of the shaft can be changed during the job more easily, although the obstacles of doing that are more in obstacles of engineering and design than they are of, of actually, um, of, of, construction with proper coating going to rock and they can be very large and they can actually you can actually use them to support a structure with a single drill shaft or a couple three drill as opposed to multiple driven piles disadvantages and this is always the been the, the key successful construction depends upon the quality control and the contractor the contractor can exercise on the poor Defects are usually not visible and they can be serious. Fortunately, we have methods of, uh, we're going to talk about those with, in dynamic testing, of, and, and, and other type, um, of actually detecting those. We have a much better, uh, it's much easier now to find if you've got a bad drill shaft than it was, say, even 20 years ago. Um, you get cat. You don't get cavity expansion with driven piles. I mean, with drill shafts. Excuse me, as you do with driven piles. That can. What that means is that um, the weight becomes more significant because in with, with driven piles we normally ignore the weight of the weight of the pile because we're, we're assuming that whatever it displaces in the soil is going to be about the same or something like it. Um, with with drill shafts, the weight is important uh, to it's and, I'll, and it works f against you in compression and for you in tension, and um, the uh, for, but one thing that object if you have a drill shaft and a driven pile of the same size and cross section and perimeter wetted area the driven pile will have more capacity every time just about with a few exceptions maybe but not many almost inevitably driven piles will have greater capacity that means that drill shafts by necessity have to be usually run a lot larger than driven piles in size full low scale testing is mandatory um, we're seeing mitigation of this there's a lot of research going on in terms of possibly using fine element to determine axial loads, and we'll talk about that. Um, and also you've got dynamic and semi-dynamic methods. Um, CAPWAF, for example, you know, we can use dynamic methods on drill shafts, uh, and statinamic is very useful for drill shafts. The ideal case for drill shafts are 
firm soles. You say, well, what good? If you have firm soles, what do you need deep foundation for? Sometimes you do. It depends on what structure you're putting on top of it. The dry method is the best. If you've got, you're in an area with mostly cohesive soles, you're in an area where you've got cohesive soils and or rock or IGMs, and you're in an area with uh, a limited number of voids. And one thing that will really make drill shafts construction exciting is if you hit them. Because what will happen, if you're drilling through voids and you don't, you don't pay attention, you can end up filling a void in the ground with concrete rather than making a drill shaft. The, uh, and that's particularly true in the karst topography like we see around here, but uh, the dry method is, is, is the preferable way. It's the ideal way. First, you start with the, the drill rigging. You drill the shaft. If you've got a competent uh, soil, what you'll end up with in a good drill rig, what you'll end up is a nice, clean hole. Uh, you fill the lower you, you fill the lower end with shaft with concrete and place a rebar cage. How much how much lower end you fill depends entirely on the design. Uh, in some cases, if you if you, for example, um, if you're if it's a purely, it, it just depends on how much far you need to start worrying about bending effects and whatnot in the drill shaft, and which is what the reinforcement. Is one major reason why you have reinforcement, and then you put the cage in. You prefabricate the cage. You put the cage in, and from there you go ahead and fill it up, making sure that the cage stays in the center. Is centered. You've got, obviously got cover requirements for the cage at the end, which is one reason why you pour some concrete in first. Not the only one, and then you have requirements for along the side of for that, and then. You actually, you actually drop the concrete. You just have to fill the shaft. You actually drop it, and you actually use the distance at which the, you know, drop it from the top of the of the drill shaft hole, and you actually use, um, uh, you actually use a, uh, actually use the, the the impact of the of the wet concrete to compact the concrete to ensure its quality. One interesting aside is that in the past. And even some today, they will send people down these holes to inspect them before they put the drill shaft in. Um, now we've got, you know, good cameras, remote cameras that would do that job with a lot less, um, a lot safer. Let's put it that way. I say firm soles are is is really the ideal for a drill shaft. Uh, they don't need those if the holes don't need any support they're um, it, it's useful um, you don't have if you've got a really firm sole you don't have caving issues um, if you're drilling under the groundwater table you just keep the shaft pumped out until you can get the concrete in and those are that's really the best application for a drill shaft you don't always have firm soles First of all, cohesionless soils are going to cave just by their nature. And then there are some air situations such as you have with very, very soft clays and also with voids in them where you have to case the shaft as, as you're trying to install it. And there are two ways of dealing with this problem. One of them is the slurry method and the other is the casing method. Uh, both of these are illustrated here. Um, basically, you take a, a starter casing, you put a slurry method, you start in a slurry, and then once you get the slurry in, you put a casing here, um, and then you put the rebar in, and then you withdraw both the, uh, you, you would start withdrawing, you put your concrete in, as your concrete goes in, the slurry comes out, and the slurry is expelled by the concrete. Um, a regular straight up casing method is that the casing is driven uh, vibratory hammers in the 1970s large vibratory hammers revolutionized this process where you would it would be able to vibrate the casing in and then you just construct the drill shaft pretty much as you have a um, uh, if you if you do it right and you get it deep enough in the ground you 
pretty much constructed this way you would do a dry hull and then you would put the rebar in you put the concrete in and then you can vibrate the casing out uh, one of the beauties of vibratory hammers is that you can pull them out you, you can actually buy you've got a suspension on the top of the vibratory hammer and if you pull on it you can actually uh, you get a net force upward the whole the whole vibrating system will go this way if you've got the weight of it downward it'll go that way so if you so you can use the same machine without modification to go both directions and the vibratory hammer is pretty much what you've got right here that's an oldie moldy um, you have other things sometimes you will have an oscillating where instead of the vibrations this way you have the vibration this way as well you rotate it and kind of screw it in the ground um, there are a number but here you have the the you know drilling rod going through a cased hole this is crucial because as you see the difference between on the right you have a properly clean hole and that's basically due to either good casing or a firm hole in the case on the left it was not you had caving and whatnot and it's a real mess in fact I think you can actually see it in this photo you got the rebar sticking out this was a major problem with um, uh, with, with drill shafts and one reason why their acceptance took so long was getting around this problem but as I said, the methods of inspection have improved. The use of casing you know, was uh, was very significant for um, you know, for for areas where you have caving issues. In um, underreamed or bell shaft, you have you start with a straight hole. You put a, a bell and it actually it kind of it's got veins on it. You cut down, the veins pop out, and they rotate and they create this conically shaped thing at the bottom of the drill shaft. So in some cases, you have more than one bell. Uh, bell shafts are is one of the, are one of those things where it's a nice option to have, but unless you really need to, don't take it. And it only works in cohesive soils. We're going to talk about bell shafts when we get to the subject of uh, expansive soils because they're frequently used to counteract the effects of expansive soils. Drill shafts are low transfer. The only the biggest difference between you know once you get past the cavity expansion issue, the biggest uh, change you know there are several important changes noted here. Once you get past that, the, the, they're actually very similar to the driven piles, but there are some important differences. The rock socketing is one of them. Uh, you can actually rock socket. You also, the bell gives you additional uplift, especially if you have an expansive soil. Um, you can also get additional toe resistance out of it as well if you need it. Usually drill shafts are big enough where it's not really necessary, but if you need it, it's an option which is available to you. And they're used for just about everything, uh, but you know, most everything. I guess they're not ideal in some soils, as you see, um, and they do not have the, the, the cavity expansion advantages, but they are a very versatile form of deep foundation. Other types include the caissons, which is sort of the ancestor of the drill shaft. Uh, these were used, uh, like I said, the hand dug kind. Now, of course, you'd use an excavator if you use them. You don't see these very often anymore. Um, and they, um, and like I said, they're not, they're not that common now. It's kind of a way of putting a shallow foundation deeper into the ground, really. The pneumatic caissons, uh, the most famous pneumatic caisson case is that of the Brooklyn Bridge. And of course, the discovery of the bends, um, but from the divers. A uh, relative of drill shafts are auger cast piles. 
And AuditorCast files are uh, called by many names. Again, we want to keep everybody confused, so we do. Their installation, however, has some very significant differences from the uh, from that of drill shafts. You use a continuous flight auger. Notice that I oh, might as well back up. Notice that this that the flighting goes all the way to the top, oh, or actually this goes all the way into the ground or most of it. But the flighting is continuous. Also, notice with auger cast piles that. Um, in, in addition to being a continuous flight, it also is smaller. These are look quite a bit smaller than drill shafts as well. 12 to 16 inches in diameter, that's pretty typical for auger cast piles. Essentially, you drill the hole, you inject a cement and grout through the hollow stem of the auger. In other words, you run it right down through here. In other words, instead of uh, you go straight down, and as you withdraw the raise the auger, um, the um, you your um, your grout fills up the hole and keeps it from collapsing. Uh, once you get that done, then you uh, you insert, put a rebar cage, you put concrete, the grout comes out again. I kind of glossed over the tricky part. The tricky part is getting the auger out. That requires the highest degree of skill of the operator because if you get any point where the auger gets stuck, the, real, the drill rig dies, or they get come out too fast or whatnot, or you get some kind of whatever it takes to induce some kind of collapse in the hole, you pretty much have a bad auger cast pile. So it's very important that that piece of quality control be exercised diligently. And that's been a, that, that is one thing that has held back auger cast piles from greater excel, although we're seeing them more and more on different projects. Again, much of the same advantages you have with drill shafts. Um, there is some soil compaction because the grout is in, injected under pressure. It's not like a drill shaft where there's really little or none. Um, the uh, uh, Again, with the biggest, the trickiest part is getting the auger back out. Um, with cobbles and boulders, um, it they are they're very problematic. In fact, that's true about any drill, um, with about any, any deep foundation really is, is a problem, but Especially auger cast piles. Uh, with drill shafts, you you know the the drills are, the shafts are usually big enough where you can deal with it, or you can use rock teeth. Um, driven piles also have issues with cobbles and boulders. I said no check on capacity. There's no natural check on capacity. You have to. However, one advantage to auger cast piles as opposed to drill shafts is they're generally smaller. They could be stack low tested much easier. Static. Geotechnical capacity analysis of drill shafts. And I might add auger cast piles, which is very similar. You don't have, in addition to the lack of cavity expansion, although you have a little bit with uh, auger cast piles, you do not have um, the, um, you, you, you don't have the proliferation of methods with uh, driven in terms of capacity methods. The same comments I made to bearing capacity and settlement apply with drill shafts as they do with driven piles. I also would say, say that a TZ method is the best way of estimating the uh, settlement of a drill shaft, as is the case with driven piles and auger cast piles. So therefore, those two, uh, particularly with the settlement, We've pretty much covered the sum of the bear capacity issue is very much the same. But how but the methodologies are not as proliferated. The method we're going to use and the main method used in this country is the method of O'Neill and Reese, in which they developed in the late nineties. Um, the drill sh drill shafts have not and have not had the 
just the spread of different methods, such as we've seen with um, art with um, the uh, with driven piles. That's the good news. Uh, and we can break down different types of wing soils are driven in four different classifications. Uh, cohesive soils and granular soils, cohesionless soils. Uh, intermediate geomaterials, which are between soil and rock. And rock, which, which obviously is an important part of the design of drill shafts. We aren't going to spend a lot of time with the latter two. I'm going to primarily to introduce the topic. I'm going to probably primarily stick with um, with soils for the drill shaft methods. We you, you can get into it, th those those methods tend to get fairly involved. O'Neill and Reese's original reference, the original the uh, 1999 or the old drill shaft manual, is on my website. As is the new drill shaft manual. The biggest difference between the two is the introduction of LRFD. If we're talking about now, this is where this method is different. If you from the method I did for driven piles, and um, I want to be kind of be fairly try, try to break things apart a little bit because I think there's, a, there's students get confused with this stuff. You may recall from my lectures on driven piles that we had alpha methods and beta methods. You may also recall that um, we have discovered that um, no driven pile capacity is still very much a um, Driven pile capacity is still, you know, the the f the little f of s is dependent one way or the other on f of s whether you have a cohesionless soil or a cohesive soil, and that a purely uh, alpha type method where we're just strictly going off of the cohesion is really not appropriate for driven piles. Uh, that's my opinion. I know that people disagree with me on it, but I think I think it's becoming more obvious that, that is the case. Uh, to, to a larger uh, group of people. With drill shafts, we are still using alpha and beta methods. And basically, the key to, um, and your book, by the way, has a, um, has, a has both of these. And your book has a description. Now, the method your book uses and mine are basically the same. The difference between the two is that the books is a very simplistic representation of it, and mine is a little bit more elaborate. Although, particularly for clays, they're basically the same. Basically, in an alpha method, the uh, and your your book discuss, discusses this. The little FS, the unit resistance along the shaft at fully mobilized resistance, is equal to the product of the cohesion or undrained shear strength and an alpha factor. And so therefore, that's how you compute that little F of S. In the case of the shaft, in the case of the alpha factor, depends upon the CU. If CU is less than 150 kPa or 3 KSF, alpha is 0.55. And if alpha is greater, if CU is greater than 250 kPa or 5 KSF, then alpha is equal to 0.45, and you literally, you literally interpolate between the two. That's exactly what your book, although your book puts it in a little bit different form, they're basically the same. Um, the one other tricky part with drill shafts, and, and that's a fairly simple method if you're in clays, you have your CU, you just multiply the alpha and you're done. You get a little F of S. The tricky part, one of the tricky parts is the excluded zone. With drill shafts, we throw out the top five feet of the 
uh, drill shaft because of insulation considerations as non-conforming elements. We don't count on that to help us out. At the bottom of it, we throw out the uh, one diameter as non-conforming. That doesn't help us out either. So therefore, all the only thing you worry about with a drill shaft is everything in the middle with incohesive soils. In cohesion soils, that's not true. The tow capacity is equal to uh, the unit tow capacity is equal to N sub C times C U. And it's equal to some bearing capacity factor. Now, traditionally, alpha methods for driven piles at NC of 9, that goes back to Tomlinson. With this, you have to check again. It's a function of the of of the uh, c value of cohesion, and then you multiply that in turn by the cohesion to get q would be the unit weight, and then you multiply it by the cross section area. One of the beauties of drill shafts, you don't have to worry about plugging or hollow sections or anything like that. They just Drill shafts just are what they are, and they're round. At least we hope they're round, and that they simply bear the load that way. With cohesionless soils, uh, we, it's a straight beta method, as you can see up here. The F of S is equal to beta times the effective stress. Now, the beta given it, the formula for beta given in your book. Is the same as basically this is the same format as these are. The difference between the two now these are all based upon a couple of things. One of them are in sixty values. For example, if the in sixties are less than fifteen blows per foot, then you use one set of betas. The first two, this one, and this one. If the in sixty is greater than fifteen, you use these two. And I've got one for SI units and one for US units. And your book doesn't even touch SI units. And the last two are for gravelly sands or gravels and for N60 greater than 15 BPF. So you've got three different cases and two formulas for each because one is in, the first one is in US units and the second one is in, is in um, SI units. And these, you can use these in the place of the ones given in your book, and I'll show you where it shows that. And then for tow resistance, QB is equal to either the unit tow resistance is equal to 1.2 times N60 or 57.5 N60 if it's in KPA. And in both cases, in both cases, the tow should never exceed 60 KSF. Now you ask, what do I do with all this? You do it exactly the same way as you did with driven piles. I went through with driven piles about how you uh, compute the perimeter. And you remember my wonderful demonstration with this about how you do that. And it's especially apt for drill shafts because as is the case with this, drill shafts are round. So the perimeter is the same and the area is the same. It's basically the same. Once you get past the difference between the drill shafts and the driven piles is not the basic method. It's the formulas to set up FS and QB or QT. Design examples from your book. Um, you will note a few things. Again, this this suggests a spreadsheet. It should. It gives you. Um, we have a a drill shaft or a potential drill shaft with uh, it starts at ground level four at four uh, feet you have a water table then the sand down to some limestone and you've got these end values along here now this is not unusual to have various end values and you have to either homogenize those end values or split it up into layers in the case of where they did this one they actually homogenized them now the beta value, it was interesting, they use, the formula you'll notice is in a very similar format to the ones that I use, but it's a little different. Um, and uh, there, I would, what I would do is, of course, obviously the depth intervals are given to you. 
Um, they want, first of all, the ultimate geotechnical load is 425 tons, which is basically the allowable is 170. They want a factor of 52 and a half. Therefore, ultimate is 425 tons. This is kind of the reverse from, well, I compute the ultimate load, and then I pull it back with a factor of for allowable. In this case, I'm given an allowable load, and I have to determine what ultimate load I'm going to design to. So it's, it's, it's the reverse of that. And then from there, you have the straight side drill shaft, three foot diameter, length of 60 feet. Um, therefore, the perimeter is 9.42 feet, and you can compute all of your areas based on that perimeter, and that's what we're doing here. We have four, this is four feet times that gets this, four minus 30 is 26 times that to get that, and then we have the surface area down 30 feet times that to get that. So that's how we get those areas. The vertical effective stress, the same way we did it with drill it with the Flenius method. You take the you take the middle value, you take the average value between the top and the bottom, or you compute the effective stress halfway through the layer. Either way is acceptable, and it's the same thing all over again. Where things change from the Flanus method to cohesionless soils here is right here. And what I would do is they use one set of formulas. I would use the formulas I gave previous to that. And they, you've got enough information to comp use those. Where you've got your N60 values, you've got the ZI. And by the way, the ZI, for the, as is the case here, the ZI is in the middle of the layer. Both of these from the same format, but the ZI for both sets are in the middle of the layer. And then once you compute that, you go through every, all the shafts, you get, uh, you multiply beta times that times this surface area to get that. This times this times this gives you that. This times this times this gives you that. You add it up, you get a shaft resistance of 355.1. Kips. And then base resistance, you're given, you know, the you know your N60 at the base, then there, therefore you, uh, which is 21, then you use that equation 945, which is exactly the one I gave you, you get 25 up to KSM, oh, excuse me, let me back up, I gotta be careful. This is in TSF, therefore this is going to be a ton. I said KSF, no, no, KIPS, no, tons. Um, I prefer to do my calculations in KIPS, but sometimes the formulas are given in tons. In fact, uh, and I, I think it'd be a lot simpler to do it in KIPS, but they do it in tons, so we'll have it in tons. So you've got now, if, if Q, if this is, if Q, or little Q, or the effective stress are in tons per square foot, then therefore, you're going to go with tons. If they're in kips per square, you're going to go with kips. So be careful about that. And then we multiply TSF. We multiply it by the cross-sectional area, which is 7.07 .07 cubic a square feet. You get 89.1 tons. Um, and there, therefore, you compare that to the... Um, uh, the total of that is about 444 tons, which is greater than 44, to, then 425 tons, which is what you asked for. We were asked to, to, to meet, so you're fine. A, the cohesive example in the book is also, is also in the book. And here you've got an interesting state of affairs. Now I would look at this example very carefully. Because you've got a silty clay down to about 32 feet, and then you've got sand down to 80. You've got end values. You've got uh, undrained shear strength or cohesion here, which is 0.8 TSF, again, tons per square foot. And then you've got the sand with your end values. Now, you've got two layers of sand, of clay. Why do you have two layers of clay? Ah, this is where the non-excluding zone. 
you have an exclusionary zone at the top of five feet. So therefore what you do is you create a zero to five layer and then you just kind of just go to blow through it and say it's zero. That's how you include those. If you had clay at the toe, you'd have another exclusionary layer at the toe, but you don't have that. You instead have sand at the toe, so there's no exclusionary layer at the toe. That's, this is interesting. What happens when you mix soils? With alpha, with a, with a pure beta method like Fellenius, it's fairly simple. With an alpha plus beta method like we're using here, it's a little more complicated, so you have to be careful. The second layer is a clay from 5 to 32 right through here. And again, we have the depth interval. The surface area is computed the same way we did the last time. The shear strength, or undrained shear strength, is 0 0.80 TSF. Alpha is 0.55, and it explains that my alpha computations are identical. Why are they identical? I'll show you. Basically, what it says here is that my um, C's of U is 0.8 TSF, or 1.6 KSF. You will note that if CU is less than 3 KSF, then alpha is 0.55. Same thing. Your book will give you the same result. And then um, with the sand, it's a, uh, and that, and the alpha point, you multiply this by this by this, you get that in times. The sand layer. You have to compute the average effective stress just like you do with the, um, irrespective of the fact that you don't really, ir irrespective of the fact that the clay area doesn't worry about effective stress, the sand area does, and the effect of the clay here is significant. So you have to add, all, you have to input all that. You come up with an effective stress in this particular case of 1.769 TSF. This area, and it's halfway down. It's halfway down. We've actually, one thing we've, we've had to assume is that what we've done is the following. Um, we've decided to, depth of penetration of 50 feet, we've decided to assume a 50 foot penetration. If you have a situation where you're asked to determine the foot, uh, feet of penetration, um, you're going to need to be flexible, a little more flexible about this. And there, are, and there you could use, very, it, it, depending on the stratigraphy, if the stratigraphy is fairly simple, you could back solve it. If it's not, you may have to use um, either multiple guesses, which, probably, which with spreadsheet would be fairly simple, or you'd have to use gold seek or something like that. Um, but in any event, you get down to, we're assuming the 50 foot long shaft. Um, we get those and we get a total cube tons of, and it shows you how it computes this using its formula. And you get 304 tons. Then the base resistance being the same, we use the sand formula, the same one we used for the last problem, we get 106 tons. So the 416 tons is greater than 375. It's possible we could shorten the shaft a little bit. We may or may not want to do that. We may want to leave it where it is. Um, there are, again, this, this problem is a good illustration of how you deal with multiple soils. You have to basically design the portions of the drill shaft, which are clay, using the clay alpha method, and the portions of the drill shaft, which are sand, using the sand beta method. And that's basically how you design the drill, design drill shafts. Uh, it's a little more complicated than it is with like Flenius's method, which is a straight up beta method across the board. But ultimately the way you apply it is the same. Um, I would strongly suggest as far as checking the settlement the book presents what was really used to be called the old drill shaft method. Um, 
I think you know, to check a settlement if it's reasonable is a good idea. I think a better method would be to set it up in the TZ program and run it that way. But at this point, that concludes our, our lecture on drill shafts. Until next time, thanks for watching and God bless.